program. So I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to learn about the art, the director's concept and some of the background of these offers. And thank you very much. Um, an emphasis from the book of Genesis. And I'll read you that quotation. And God said, yes? And God said, let us make man in our own image after our own likenesses. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So, we are creation of God. And as such, in, 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 uh, admonished, not admonished, encouraged to become better, to make better our nature. And through this, the experience of Bildung that helps us become enriched uh, and see a glimpse of the divine here on earth while we live. Now, that concept has been secularized and is not so much connected to the religious uh, aspect of it as it once was back then. But it still, it seems like just a marvelous idea and a thing that we should do. And I have a hope that we are doing that um, during this, the, this, uh, this symposium. I'm thinking about, last night in particular, this wonderful presentation that I, I said at the end, this is Bayreuth at its best. I was just uh, um, enthralled with that, with that experience. Then we prepared to a nice little reception uh, at the, uh, uh, the gazelle shop, uh, and then we went to dinner. And as we were at dinner, uh, someone noted that there had been an earthquake in Napa Valley, California. Six, a, six, a rating of six, which is pretty big. Yeah. And what happened? Well, quick came the flash of $1 billion worth of damage already. 83 people killed, no, injured, three or four mainly, seriously injured. The forces of nature acting quickly at the very time that we are witnessing an opera related to the forces of nature, namely, the curse of the Hollander. And you will remember that the curse came when the Hollander said, I am going to sail around the Cape by God no matter what. Remember that? And God said, you are and you're gonna to continue to sail for the rest of your life until you find the redemptive love of a woman. Again, nature. That was, that was Hollander's sin, 
I mean, he was challenging God's nature. And is it there today with this earthquake? And to put the point of story, what's the lesson? We should be humbled by our, our place in the great universe. Thank you. First, um, welcome to the after hour party launch of Byro. I didn't know that such a thing existed, and now I get an idea what the singers and musicians are doing when the opera is done. Um, good that you've all found us here. Um, tonight, we're going to go into secret, and um, I think tonight is going to be the night with the most exciting stage as a, as a stage was put on. And um, you will find two locations. Um, that we're going to go to tonight. One is, is the Mount Rushmore, which is probably much more familiar to all of you than it is to me. Um, and I'd like to say something about that part coming from the United States. And the other um, uh, location is a place that a lot of people probably, a lot of people of you probably won't know at all. It is the Alexanderplatz in Berlin. And this is uh, the point where a lot of people would uh, say that the Kastorf ring now finally becomes absolutely provincial. At least it's the point where the whole meaning, if one could say so, where well, a lot of the quotations are almost entirely uh, related to the um, German history ever since reunification or the, or the conflict between East and West, where Mr. Kastorf comes from, what he was facing after reunification, how he um, reacts on that uh, both politically and also as an artist. So, um, what I would like to do um, later on would first give you some background information about what Alexanderplatz means in, as a place, both architecturally, historically, and literally uh, in Germany, and why maybe Mr. Kastorf picked it. Um, and um, the other thing is that something that occurred for me from the Valkyrie performance is that we may have to, or I may want to introduce you or to invite you um, to, um, uh, how can you say that, uh, to, to, to look at the differences of um, the ears and the eyes of a 19th century person uh, listening and seeing the uh, uh, ring for the first time and the audience here in, in how far that makes certain moves uh, that Mr. Kasparov does in his uh, way to interpret this, uh, this whole ring circle um, may be more acceptable or maybe even helpful. Uh, but we'll come to that later and then I'll hand over to Adeline. Um, in thinking of Siegfried, I think it is revolution and... Thinking of Siegfried, I think it is revolution and evolution. And I think in a way we have some clues at the, the end of the Valkyrie. When we look at the end of the van, we see this red star and these men going up and being gassed. And they're carrying a flag, which I thought, Alexander, I would ask you this flag. Do you recognize it? It's, it was a red and black flag. It was a revolutionary flag, but I don't know exactly well, if it belongs it, to anything. Yeah. I think it, it, it still belongs to the complex of the Sergei Eisenstein quotation. I mean, the, the, if you remember how this guy was di dying several times, he always fell down in this very heroic, heroic, uh, pathetic way that we know from revolutionary uh, uh, paintings or propagandas, both fascistic and, and socialistic. So I think he represents this uh, kind of um, this, 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 this death that isn't a personal death, but that kind of reflects the, um, the, the, the system that he stands for. And I think, uh, as it goes with Valkyrie, we, we were more on the communist system, we were in the before and after revolutionary Russia. So I would uh, think that was another quotation from the Eisenstein movie. Right. Uh, and to me it was interesting that after all the Valkyrie had sown, he came down and brought this flag actually put it on the on the turkey stand, which is what does that mean? Did the revolution fail and Bhutan are are they defeated sort of things. I look at Siegfried as an evolution like I said and I think that there are two ways that this revolution can take place. It it can either become a capitalist or it can become a socialist revolution. 
And I think that the placing of these scenes that are to come in Alexander Platz and using also the United States, the Mount Rushmore, is as though we had a dual, a parallel reality. And throughout the operas, we have experiences parallel reality as, as we begin to deconstruct, we see so many parallels that we have in, in life. And even with the people that he puts on stage, there are parallel realities going on to what's actually going on, to what we have known to be the operas, and, and, and what they, what is going on also. So, yes. Um, I think we missed out a very important information for those of you who are going to go there to, not tonight for the first time, and this is due to the fact that we've seen it before. Of course you're not going to see the Mount Rushmore, because what Kastov, I think, is saying is, the, well, as you probably already noticed, Kastov is not in favor for one or the other system. What he is interested in are the excuses or the justifications that system use in order to aim to be justified to aim for power, i.e. oil, i.e. Uh, gold or, uh, or the ring. So he doesn't look at systems in terms of which is the better one or which is the one that is supposed to, to win, but what do systems do in order to justify whatever they then really do in action. So if uh, the Mount Rushmore that you're going to see tonight is not the Mount Rushmore that you know from the States, it's the Mount Rushmore as a, a propaganda monument that the West side was clever enough to invent. And what he's what it shows us tonight is what it would have looked like if the Russian would have done something similar. For that, the four heads that we see are no longer American presidents, but Lenin, Stalin, uh, Mao, uh, Marx and Mao. So he's interested not to evaluate, but to show like, uh, say something like, even though it looks different, it is about the same, because the actual aim is the same. And it's interesting to see what justifications uh, the different systems develop to, 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 to justify for what they do. And if you look onto the script of the ring, you find that in the different motifs of everybody who is aiming for the ring. They are not similar motifs. Um, Frika, for example, she wants to get jewelry to be able to keep her husband at, at home um, better. Um, uh, Wotan wants to pay off his bills with, with, with the ring. Alberich takes the ring because he wants to overcome the gods. Um, the giants want the ring because they want to fight Arbery and Nibelheim. So they have all uh, justifications that make sense in, within their own system. But what they do in the end is as brutal as everybody else. So when you listen to Adelaide now, he's using a quote, and uh, there are um, quotes in popular culture, which of course is Alfred Hitchcock's North by Northwest. Um, and the other one, which refers to Kasper uh, directly, is a cover by the Purple. We told you before that he's a 70s um, rock music fan. So there's a, there was a, a very successful album by the Purple that used the Rush, uh, Mount Rushmore, putting faces of the musicians onto it. And so he's, he, again, he's using our perspectives and then breaks them at the same point. Right. I, I think that it is parallel reality, whether it is, I think it is a parallel reality, whether it's in Russia, whether it is in Mount Rushmore, or it is in Germany, it is a parallel reality, and we're all heading in the same, it's heading in the same direction, unless we are willing to listen. And what impressed me was, George Washington comes first, he's replaced by Marx, Thomas Jefferson is replaced by Lenin, and Theodore Roosevelt by Stalin, Abraham Lincoln by Mao. Think about that and see if we can see even more parallels as we think ahead, the weeks ahead. I quickly wanted to refer what David said at the beginning. Now, it seems that um, Secret probably is the most build of opera in, in the way that you described it within the whole circle. Um, we already said that um, uh, Wagner was taken from different sources. One source uh, is a very popular German fairy tale from the, the Buddha Grimm, and it's called uh, the story about one that walked out into the world to learn how to fear. Other than in the opera tonight, the way he learns to fear is that he sleeps in and somebody puts a bucket of, wa of water onto him, and that makes him learn how to, be, to feel afraid. But this uh, is a very popular, was a very, or is still a very popular fairy tale within the Grimm tales um, uh, collection, and it also shows how interested romantic people, if you think of, uh, of uh, Mary Shelley uh, 
Edgar Allan Poe and other authors how much, uh, well, how, yeah, how far people in the Romantic were interested to be thrilled and, and have this third kind of goose pimples in, in, in the literature of the time, which we also find again and again in the, in the ring because it's a, it, it, it's a whole circle of scandals and frightening things for the people of the time. So, um, what Secret describes is his is, is portrait in the tonight as a revolutionary, almost as an, like an anarchist. Um, but what, what Wagner tries to describe in the opera is this developing from a young boy that is almost innocent but doesn't have the fantasy or the intelligence or the education to know the threats of the world into someone that is adolescent, meets a woman, um, uh, learns how to make love, but also what to be afraid of, what there is to be lost in the world, and so to develop uh, the fear. Now, what you have to know about Alexander Platz, I don't know how many of you have been to Berlin before, and are a bit familiar with the place it looks like today. Um, Alexander Platz is really the spot in Berlin where it all started. They have archaeological uh, sites until today where they find proofs for people having stayed there from I don't know, 1,500 years ago. So, you know, the, the whole thing, the whole Berlin concept started there. What it does to the city is, or always did to the city, is linking the different kinds of Berlin. So, it, is, it, 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 it links the royal Berlin that you would find uh, under the Linden, under the lime trees with the castle and, 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 and the, the royal buildings. On the one side, to the cultural building, which is the museum's island, on the other side, with all these big collections that you might have visited, to uh, the oldest existing buildings in Berlin, the so-called Nikolai Viertel, which are buildings from back to the 14th century, 15th, 14th century, so it's kind of the, late, the, 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 the old, eldest existing buildings in Berlin, to then, on the other side, to the former Jewish and working class uh, uh, people uh, quarter, the so-called Scheunenviertel. So but it was almost all, everything that would be, uh, what Berlin was about could possibly meet on that spot. And that was long before East and West Berlin started to exist. In the 1930s, Alfred Dublin uh, wrote a very important German novel called, oh, don't be surprised, Berlin Alexanderplatz. Um, it is the first time, or almost the first time in German literature, that we find a, a story told out of the perspective of a loser. And I think that almost refers to the ongoing first assistant that we see in the show. The, the hero, or the anti-hero of Berlin Alexanderplatz is Franz Biberkopf. And Franz Biberkopf tries very hard to find his past through life, but always fails. Um, the way that novel is written, was later that called expressionistic literature. So it's not only that we have a new perspective within the telling, it's also the, the, the style or the, the, the way it's done um, is a kind of um, a, a new style. Um, the, film, uh, the book was turned into a film very quickly in the 1930s. Uh, the lead part was played by Heinrich George, who was one of the most important actors in the 20s and 30s in Germany and was directed by G.W. Pabst. Some of you might know him because in the 40s he, he, went, he came to Hollywood and did some biopics. He wasn't very successful in Hollywood, later returned to Germany. Um, in the 20s and the 30s he had the <coughs> reputation of doing working class uh, movies. Another very famous movie that you might uh, know is um, one with Greta Garbo from 1928. It's called The, the, Unpleasant, the, the Unpleasant Street. And it describes the story of a woman that gets more or less lost in the after-war Berlin. So they are very dark, again, expressionistic films. But this was just a cinema film, so necessarily it had to cut down the story. Um, the whole thing came back into attention about 40 years later, when, when uh, Rainer Werner Fassbinder turned the novel into a TV serial. And having thought about that today, I remember the discussions going on at the time, and they were almost as... Um, powerful and emotional as discussions are today about Castor's Ring. The whole way that um, Fassbinder worked, and he was coming from the theater as well, as, without knowing it, but I don't think that I'm completely wrong saying that he was definitely a kind of role model, model for what Mr. Castor is doing today, and uh, there's definitely a, a reference. Franz Biberkopf 
as a figure was almost a red line through Fassbinder's work, film work. In, in, in lots of films, there would be sidekicks that would call Franz or Franz Bieberkopf or Mr. Bieberkopf. So he, his entire work focused on this anti-hero. So everybody in, uh, that is kind of familiar with German culture links to uh, Berlin Alexanderplatz immediately. Now, Berlin Alexanderplatz is also um, an architectural place. And it became very important in the GDR. Now, I, I, I hope that you're more or less familiar with the um, history of East Germany. Uh, there are two both historical and architectural uh, landmarks in, within the history of the GDR. One is in 1953, when they built the um, Stalin Allee uh, as a kind of almost copy of what they then called Stalin pastry architecture, as you would find it still today in the big Russian cities. And actually the way that they put pressure on the workers uh, led to the first revolution in East Germany, uh, or actually was the first revolution in any of the East European countries, but that was then suppressed by Russian tanks. Um, in 1968, uh, 61, as you all know, the uh, uh, wall was built, and with the help of the wall, the, uh, all of a sudden the GDR succeeded in becoming relatively econo economically uh, successful. Um, with the closed borders, the, the, the highly qualified uh, worker state in the country, and also being cut off of the West, and being cut off of having to compete on the world market, the, 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 the communist uh, market uh, succeeded in kind of producing um, even more than an illusion of wealth for their people. And interesting enough, the fight of the system was not about their ideals, it was in how far and how quick they were able to give access to their people to, co to, uh, to con consume it, to, co uh, to, to goods. So what uh, the GDR succeeded in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, was to almost uh, catch up with the life standard of the West. Now how did that happen? Uh, the GDR, like the rest of Germany, had, had, had nothing no, no goods like oil or iron or anything like that. So all, all the oil, the whole en energy, everything they produced was based on oil that was pumped from Baku, that we met in uh, Valkyrie two days ago, was pumped to a little region in uh, Thuringia in, uh, in East Germany and was there turned into plastic products. Funny enough, this pot pipeline was called Grushka. Now Grushka means, means friendship. But as a matter of fact, if Grushka was cut off, the whole GDR would have collapsed. Now, in order to present these concurrence of the systems, uh, the GDR decided in the 60s and 70s, and we have two architects here from Berlin that might be able to correct me if I'm saying something wrong here, and they decided to present themselves in a new form of architect architecture. And that was uh, mainly built up around Alexanderplatz. The old buildings all had to vanish finally, those that had, had been left over from uh, World War II. And um, they built some socialistic abbreviation of what we know from our cultures as well, 1970s architecture, lots of concrete, places with uh, uh, almost no trees. Um, uh, at the end, at the uh, at the uh, uh, Alexanderplatz was the kind of showpiece for this success that they finally have reached. Um, you always have to remember, this was nothing abstract. Uh, West Berlin and East Berlin were as close as the two of us. So there was, comparing the system was just walking 500 meters more west, more east to see, to prove right or wrong. Um, so this was nothing that you could make up, you had to really give proof to it. Now there were these two big department stores in Berlin. One was the KDW that you all know, or have heard of, and the other one was the Central Department Store, and that was located uh, Zentrum, sorry, that was located, guess it, on the Alexanderplatz. It was a place where people from all GDR would travel to, because in that department stores you could get things that you wouldn't get anywhere else in the GDR. So this was, it was kind of their way to present the West, look how far we, we came, um, but also they couldn't keep it up to their own people because it was something that was, you know, only to be established at one spot, but not for the whole country. Um, so the diversity within what happened to the GDR 
or it is very much fixated on this place. The other big building on the place that represents this kind of contradiction in itself is the TV tower, or as the Berliners call it, the TV asparagus, which is a huge, huge uh, tower that has become, even after unification, the landmark of Berlin next to the Brandenburg Gate. Now, the controversy in, uh, in it is that they had a great uh, effort in kind of making sure that the two TV programs they had in the GDR, that was, of course, in complete state control, was being able to be broadcasted everywhere, but the same effort they spent on abandoning people from watching West television. Now, how did they do this? For once, when you know, Color TV came up, which, which they started in the late 60s, they chose the, uh, there was Paul and Sekam. Sekam was developed in France, Paul was developed, I think, in England or in America. So, when West Germany would decide that their Color TV would run on Paul, of course, GDR uh, decided to have their Color TV run on Sekam. So, if you would watch uh, West television with a GDR television set, you were not able to see the color, but in black and white. So the effort to get their information, pass their information to the people, at the same time and cutting them away from the other information was almost equal and shows, uh, it's kind of manifested in this uh, TV tower. And, and the third, and to me personally, it was always the most cynical um, monument that they built on Alexanderplatz, and you will find that tonight in this kind of micro version of Alexander Platz on stage again, is the so-called Weltzeituhr. Now the Weltzeituhr means a watch that shows you the, uh, the, work, the time on any place on the world. Now if you imagine you live in a country that you're not allowed to leave, um, and, uh, and if you're lucky, the only other countries that you're going to see are Hungary, Czechoslovakia, or Poland, and maybe Russia then you would ask yourself, why in the center of this country would you put in a watch where people could sit and find out what the time in New York, London, Paris, Amsterdam would be, acknowledging at the same time that they, in their, in their lifetime, would never be able to go there. I always thought, like, how absurd, how, how, how and, 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 and cynical. I mean, it, it was almost like the state was showing the people their, 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 their might on limited, limiting them in, in, in their way to, to move. So, um, people in the GDR, if they were traveling within the country, they would go to Berlin and they would go to Alexanderplatz first because they wanted to go to the Centrum Kaufhaus and uh, buy goods that they couldn't get anywhere else. Secondly, because that was, you know, the, the hippest place in the country. So, if Mr. Kastoff puts that into the production, it is also about, and here we come, go back to the Brecht theater theory, and that's also the, the way that the East would look on system theory it is always theory and practice. You have a theory of the system and you have a practice of the system. Now the theory of the system, the way they wanted to see themselves, is the Mount Rushmore. It is like they succeeded. Uh, the practical uh, socialism is what was happening uh, in and around the Alexanderplatz. And, you have, always have to know when the GDR declined in the last year, it was always their excuse. They said, this is the real, the, 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 uh, the real socialism, and it's not what, 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 we, what we're attempting to go for. So please, please always understand, we're not there yet. And don't complain, because we have to go through this, uh, to, to, to this situation in order to end up on the Mount Rushmore, or whatever the illusion uh, was. Now, what is happening uh, uh, here in, in, um, on this Alexanderplatz is almost a situation after reunification. The place in, tonight is no more glamorous. Um, and uh, again, we find all these de-illusioned, de de not deconstructed, deconnected people meeting there. Uh, and again, whereas the music tells us that they have deep connections, that Siegfried and Brunhilde are facing eternal love, what we see on stage is the absolute opposite. Yeah? And, and, and again, this is deconstruction, decontextation, if that makes sense to you. You, 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 you even cut, uh, uh, cut the script out of the context. But why, would, why, you know, why, why would this take place on the Berlin Alexanderplatz? And it's also irritation. Like, um, we meet a lot of things that literally won't make sense. Like, for example, and you probably heard about that, um, 
uh, we, we kind of find three crocodiles running around Alexanderplatz. So there have been a lot of things we've seen on Alexanderplatz, but as far as I know, never crocodiles, not to talk of three of them. But now, I can't tell you what these crocodiles are about. There are some suggestions that say it is this uh, cro crocodile or reptiles in general are a psychoanalytic symbols for, uh, for the power of sexuality. Um, there are others that call it uh, the, 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 the crocodiles as a symbol for capitalism. Um, you might find a story amusing about it. Um, last year, the, the ring started with two crocodiles. And then when, when we were uh, 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 got, uh, got to see it the first time, which was like in the last week again, like this year, one crocodile has vanished. And nobody could explain where the crocodile had ended to. Any other that cast off, who's, who likes to repeat himself from time to time, used the crocodile in another production. So this production had to leave by one earlier than the first one. <laughs> Now, this year, we find two crocodiles, two adult ones, uh, three crocodiles, two adult ones, and a baby crocodile, and that is also the explanation why last year we only had one crocodile, because the explanation now is the second one was pregnant already and felt sick and couldn't come to the stage. <laughs> that's why we get um, compensation by having a crocodile, a sweet third crocodile baby, there tonight. Um, there are, there are other symbols um, that you might find more severe and, um, and more disturbing. Um, and that brings me to the second part that I was mentioning in the beginning. Um, having seen the cast or seeing the customer for the second time, I find myself things making more sense and uh, annoyingly less than on the first time. And I ask myself, like, how would a 19th century person having read or heard the ring at the time. I mean, um, what we have, if, we, if you take the ring for what it is, it, 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 it does introduce us to a brother and sister love, um, a, a, a woman that sends out her husband to steal money or gold, um, a father that uh, uh, leaves his daughter to a public rape, um, a husband that creates three, eight daughters with another woman, and I could go on and put on like this. Now, I imagine the moral standards of the time wouldn't have even allowed to think about such a thing, uh, not to mention to put them on stage. I'd personally be interested how in less than four or five generations we succeeded to kind of blend that out. I think this is, it is a, psycho, a psychological process that you can cut out, out things that you don't want to see because we again end here with a perception that the gods should be gods and therefore role models. Now, please always keep in mind that for Wagner, the developing scale was not uh, a human being becoming divine, but the human being overcoming uh, the gods and become himself the highest, um, uh, the, the highest form of, of being at all. So it shows in some way that Wagner is way ahead of us because it, with our Christian background we still think that we are somewhere in between nature and gods and therefore the gods have to be some kind of better than us or role models or shouldn't you know, run around as prostitutes. Um, I don't think that this was the view that uh, Wagner had and I think uh, Kastorf, and of course we find that sometimes repulsive and I think that is because it was repulsive at the time as well. Uh, just reminds us of that. Um, that I think you can look at the Rhine Maidens as slots because that's what Fricka calls them at some point. She says they are riding around with too many married, married men. I think somebody who sells out his, his, sells out his sister-in-law in order to pay his bills, you can call him a pimp, what else? And so on and so on. And I think this is what Kastorf always brings back to attention. Now, the, the um, um, the, the difficult thing for him is that we are so sophisticated and we are so trained on splatter movies and pornography that there's hardly anything that could really shock us anymore. And I find it interesting that he still succeeds in doing so. Like one thing, and you'll find that again tonight uh, uh, coming back into reference, was the rainbow flag at the end of Rheingold that um, Nima was pulling. Now you could easily say this was the rainbow that they were walking through a holler, but then we also know that the rainbow flag is the gay and lesbian right flag. And we come back to that when we meet Mima tonight, 
because it's indicated, and it's only indicated, it's not spoken out, but that there might be, that, that Mima might be homosexual, and that there might have been an abusive, abusive case between him and Siegfried, which would, all, which would also explain why Siegfried hates him so much. So it's not that Kastorf brings out, uh, states that, but he kind of implicates it. And I would say um, uh, sexual abuse with children is one of the very last taboos that we have and that we strongly uh, react on. The other one was the kiss that Wotan gave to Valkyrie at the end of Valkyrie. And I thought that the booze uh, were referring to that. Um, and I thought, yes, this is shocking because we were told by the libretto this is, you know, big love and he, he regrets, and blah, 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 and they say farewell and he still loves him. As a matter of fact, he still puts her into the public as public flesh. And this is exactly the punishment that he put on to her, and he's the first one to take advantage of it. And I think, again, it's not that you would like such an image, but Kastorf succeeded to shock us, as maybe Wagner succeeded to shock the public of his time at the time. Another reference to that is the sword. We were all very surprised that the sword would come in as a natural prop in a, a Valkyrie from the day before yesterday. Well, be assured it won't stay this way because tonight the sword is going to be changed into a Kalashnikov. And it, therefore, and now it becomes again the most effectful, the most effective weapon of our time. It's no longer a mythical thing that people would dance around. It is the gun that you can kill people with the most in the less uh, usage of time. And I have to wear everybody of you, make aware everybody of you, especially who uh, are wearing ear, uh, ear helps, that this Kalashnikov is going to shoot off tonight. And again, this is a story in the first, on the first uh, secret performance someone fainted because his shooting came um, unexpectedly. I personally think that this was a paid extra by Mr. Kasper so that he had another scandal, but I don't have any proof of that. Thank you very much. We are getting uh, on. Yeah, I have a, a question. Pardon me. Yes. I, I understand the cast-off um, uh, origin, as it were, a separate theatrical uh, vision. And I've seen it translated as uh, post-dramatic theatre. Uh, I wondered if you could make a few comments on that, and whether there's been um, other operas produced using that theatre. Um, as a matter of fact, the, um, the catalogue of directors that are in Bayreuth uh, working uh, at the moment, uh, and this is what some people object to the festival, they are, you could say, the same school. Uh, Baumgartner, uh, Schlingensief uh, and Kastorf, they have been working on the same theatre, the, the, uh, the Kastorf Theatre in Berlin, the Volksbühne, and they all work in that direction and intention. They, you know, they, they, they break your expectations, they don't fulfill them, and if you get not used to that, they will kind of break that again. Um, and, uh, well, if you go to Tannhäuser uh, the other night, you will find a production that's completely different, but that still has in the same kind of uh, headspace. Or